from avoiding a narcissist in your future. 10 tactics for avoiding a, a narcissist in your future, as well as a couple of ideas about why you're attracting them in the first place, attracting them, why they are, I mean, anyone attracts a narcissist, okay, you guys, because a narcissist goes where a narcissist can get supply. They'll go to anyone they can, but why are you more attractive? Why are they, you know, you know what I'm saying? All right, so number one thing on this list of how to avoid a narcissist in your future is to educate yourself. Educate yourself on narcissism, educate yourself on red flags, understand the red flags. I have got a multitude, many, many videos on red flags, as do other people out there. So there is a lot of information out there. Getting informed can help you to have at least a sense of awareness. All right. That's not enough. Being informed is not enough. Being informed is just one step. It's a good first step. It's a good step for anyone to understand because narcissists can come in any place in your life. They can be a coworker, a boss, a friend, and I mean, it could be anyone, right? It's not necessarily just romantic relationships. It can be a family member. And it's not necessarily that you need to like, ah, narcissist run. It's okay. I'm dealing with a narcissistic person. That means they think this way. And that means they behave this way. That means I'm not going to engage in these ways. Does that make sense? or you cut them off depending on what you need to do for your life. So education is a good first step. It's a good beginning. It's not enough. It is very much not enough because people will, then what happens, you meet one, you hang out with them for a while, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so stupid. I should have known better. I knew all the red flags. Well, no, because it's not enough. It's not enough just to know them. It can happen because there's covert narcissists. There's many types of narcissism. You can educate yourself you can be like someone like myself or like Angie and still have someone come in and then be like, whoa, okay, pull back, right? So it can happen. Anyway, so let's talk about other things since that's not enough. Number two, this is big. Boundaries, you guys. We've got to learn what those are. We've got to learn what they mean for you personally, what they are in your life and how to implement them, how to hold them and how to so nothing teaches you boundaries better than low contact with a narcissist. It teaches you about where the lines are crossed, where your lines are crossed, what it feels like when your lines are crossed within your body, within your emotions, in your head. It teaches you all of it, right? It's a, it's a horribly difficult, challenging, impossible place to live, right? But it does teach you a lot. So if you're low contact with a narcissist, use it. I always say, if you have to be involved with something that is uncomfortable, something that is painful, something that is difficult like this, like dealing with a toxic person, use it to learn what you can about yourself because you can't get out of it, right? This is if you're a low contact and can't get out, you're co-parenting, you're or parallel parenting, whatever, and you're, um, can't get away, right? Or a parent or a relative that you simply can't get away from. Use the information not to beat yourself up, not to go into the despair of dealing with them. Yeah, you're going to get knocked down when you're dealing, going low contact. When you're low contact with a narcissist, you're going to get knocked down a lot. You're going to have your boundaries stepped on. You're going to have, you're going to set a boundary and then they're going to come in from the side with something else and cross that line over and over and over because that's dealing with narcissists, okay? But what it teaches you is where your boundaries are. And the reason it's so uncomfortable and infuriating is someone's crossed them. So that doesn't mean, like, that's a whole nother topic for another time about how to, how to work low contact. And I just talked about it last week, but that's a good place to learn your boundaries. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that was a boundary. I now, Because a lot of people, when they've been with toxic people, when they've been in nar relationships with narcissists or other types of toxic people, they don't know what their boundaries are because they're so used to just trying to keep the peace, walking on eggshells. They're so invested in making the other person happy and making everything okay and in, in, in letting that other person emotionally rule the entire relationship and house and all of that, that we don't learn what our boundaries are. Boundaries. One big one you can learn right now as we sit here, how do you want to be treated? Expect it. If it's not there, there's a boundary. That doesn't mean you got to force people to constantly and forever treat you the way you want to be treated. Healthy, good relationships have flexibility. They have 
highs and lows. They have moods. People have, you know, we're not, it's not like perfect. Oh, yay, that person's perfect. They're safe. No, it's how do you expect to be treated? Kindness, understanding, empathy, compassion. Those are pretty basic, but they're pretty, but they're pretty real. And when you're dealing with a narcissist, you get none of them. Well, you get kindness and you get fake compassion, but it's super intermittent and it's, it's always transactional. I'll give this to you if you'd give that, you know, there's all the things that go with narcissism. So how about fair? How about like, think about it. And, and those are the things that if you can keep clear in your head and someone's not doing it in a new relationship, back out, right? That is a big, huge thing when someone crosses your boundaries. Other boundaries too, pushing you to do things that are cross your moral lines. I mean, we could go on and on about the boundary pushing, right? But, but really a big one is how do you want to be treated? Now, remember a sociopathic person, a psychopathic person, they can get in quickly because they don't cross those boundaries early on. So again, this is not enough. Understanding and educating and boundaries, not enough. We got to go on to the next thing. So number three, self-advocate early on. Okay, so you set these boundaries or you have something you see you don't like or you have something you want to do and they don't want to do it, whatever it is. You self-advocate early on for yourself. You stop trying to people please in order to get people to like you. Break that codependent, break that people pleasing trait, whatever you want to call it. And just advocate, no, I don't actually want to do that. Or I actually would rather do this. Or, you know, have a have a clear voice that is your own self-advocating for whatever it is you need to do. Keep your distance early on so that you're not jumping right into someone else's life. You're not jumping right into fixing their problems. You're not jumping right into all of the things that make codependency big in our lives, right? And don't overshare. That's another boundary that you have with yourself, but it's also a form of self-advocating where you give the information out as you see appropriate. Stop oversharing. Don't talk about your past traumas, your past relationships and all that early on with someone. You can say, yeah, I was in a difficult thing and, and yeah, it's over. I'm healing. I've, I've been through stuff. It's, you know, we all have. Play it down. Don't, don't overshare. Don't overshare with anything because a, a toxic person will, or overshare on purpose with one thing and see where they go with it. Because <laughs> a toxic person will use that information for the rest of the relationship in order to twist things. They're grooming you in the beginning. Toxic people are grooming you from day one, from second one, from before second one, from the moment they look at you across the room. From the moment there's eye contact, they're grooming you. So you don't want to give too much information really to anyone. Oversharing is uncomfortable for people who are not toxic, right? If someone's oversharing, you're like, why are they telling me this? I don't know them. Or they're going, wow, they really need to talk. And, and it can be really like uncomfortable. But for someone toxic, it's like, oh, yeah, give it to me, right? Okay, so stop that. Five, self-reflect a lot. Self-reflection without judgment. Self-reflection gives you a chance after you've been around someone new, after you've been around someone not new, whatever, to feel how you feel about the situation, about yourself. If, are you picking up their energy? One way in which empathy works in me, and I don't know about you guys, but one way in which it works, and it's why it's why coaching works for me as a as with other people, right? It's why I work as a coach, because I feel and I hmm. It's like an intuitive feeling of other people's energy and other people's what they're going through. I don't know what they're going through. I can't say, oh, I'm, you know, I know exactly what you mean. But it's like a feeling. It's a felt sense. And so when I'm with someone and I step away and I don't feel like myself, right? So I have a strong sense of what I am on my own, who I am of myself. So I'm able to tell wait, why do I feel so self-loathing right now? Oh, wait a minute. That person must be struggling with that. I wonder if they are. I don't know that they are, but it's an entirely a possibility. When you're with a narcissist, you get a feeling, feeling of giving all my energy, a feeling of, um, it, it's going to be different for everyone. So you learn, and I'm able to self-reflect in that way. Other people, it's, it's in their minds and other people, it's in their feelings. It just depends on how you personally function, right? So um, self-reflection helps. It's taking time away from the relationship to reflect on your own impressions in life. That's it. Your own impressions of what just happened. 
your version. Reflect. Don't judge it. You might catch things. You might catch good things. You might catch bad things, right? So, okay. Don't overlook things. When you're with someone new, this is a red flag thing, but it's a it's a it's one we do easily because we go into the fantasy brain, right? Of what what could be. We get excited. It's nice to be excited by new people. And it's scary and it's terrifying when you've had when you've had a narcissist in your past. Okay. So don't overlook things like jabs they make, little jabs. Um, being rude to other people, being rude to you, jokes at your expense. Um when they or when they admit fully what they are. Yeah, I'm not really good in relationships at all. You know, well, okay, take things at face value for a while. Try it. <laughs> okay. Um, the next one is rock solid self confidence. Rock solid self confidence. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. No, but really, self confidence that you're okay alone. You don't need this person. You don't, you are here because you want to be here, not because you need to be here. You are not here to serve them. You're here to hang out with them, to be with them, to understand them, to learn about them. And for yourself, you're there for, because you enjoy it. You are able to know your worth. Okay. You are not going to lower your expectations. You're not going to lower your standards. You're going to have a window of expectations and standards, and they're all going to be reasonable, but pretty high. High meaning I, will be treated with respect. I will have kind, compassionate, affectionate, empathic people around me. I will, you know, those kind of things. Those are high. Those are high for our standards, but they're pretty basic for people who don't want toxic people in their life. Avoid controllers. Avoid them. If someone's being controlling of your time, of your texting time, of your family time, of your, like early on, of it's it's too big a red flag now by avoid sometimes people get anxious okay and they'll they might they might if you say to them hey i need a little space go back to your boundaries and they don't give it to you bye right it's not worth it because something's up some they're controlling for for some reason and it's not usually a good one so let's learn to not be such good supply number one thing with an empathic person we have got to learn how to feel empathy for someone without giving a response to that empathy to them. You can, there's so many people who feel sorry for their toxic partners, who feel empathy, who feel guilt, shame, whatever it is for not talking to them, who logically you think this person hurt you. You owe them this much. Nothing. Nothing. And from where I said, I get angry at the toxic person, not at the person who's telling me, of course, you know, because there's this nice, wonderful, caring person and all this loving energy is being poured into the void. So we have got to learn that we can feel all of that. We can feel bad that they're alone. Sure. We can feel bad that they are suffering because they can never have a loving, healthy relationship. We can feel whatever what we feel through our empathy, but don't give a response based on that empathy to someone who's toxic because that's supply that isn't offering of caring, giving compassion. It is simply supply and it is burning your energy out. It's using you, it's hurting you, and it's making it so you can't see it's making you think that being an empath is a bad thing or <laughs> having empathy is, is, is hard is, you know, learn to take this compassion we have based on empathy and place it elsewhere in life where people who can receive it, a narcissist can't receive it. They just eat it. They just take it. My name is Lise Colucci and I'm one of the life coaches over at queenbeing.com.